You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. You're sitting across from a beautiful woman at dinner in an upscale restaurant. Wine is flowing, as are her engaging and jaw-droppingly honest stories. The stories are frank, funny, and told with such warmth that it makes you feel like you're catching up with an old friend. But these are not your average life stories. These are first-hand experiences from a woman who has spent decades on dozens of television shows and major motion pictures and is still on major network TV today. You're hearing deeply personal and revealing information from this NAACP award winner, who was handpicked by President Obama to lead a National Advocacy Advisory Committee. Though each recollection is layered with humility and relatability, the reality is that she's a multimillionaire married to an NBA champion. She hangs out with the likes of Prince, Beyonce, Oprah, and a squad of A-list celebrities. Gabrielle Union has channeled her most open and vulnerable self. She sits beside you with a glass of Pinot and shares her most interesting, thought-provoking, and moving stories. She talks about her childhood, career, love life, and more, in no particular order. They're all in her New York Times bestseller, We're Going to Need More Wine, stories that are funny, complicated, and true. Each of the 20 chapters in the book is a standalone story in which Union expertly drops you into a new segment of her life. One chapter opens with you in a high school classroom missing your homework assignment. Another chapter plops you down on the aisle of your doomed wedding. Still another chapter drops you in the middle of a Hollywood set rubbing elbows with Heath Ledger, Andrew Keegan, and Julia Stiles. This is in stark contrast to the many tear-jerking chapters such as a story about being sexually assaulted as a teenager, which the book is now known for. The 20 stories are woven together with various overarching themes and ideas that Union wants you to walk away with. The four most prominent are, one, the world is bigger than you know, expanding beyond your tiny town. Two, love is a steep learning curve, navigating love over a lifetime. Three, some things never change. The harsh realities of fame, Hollywood, and the life of a celebrity while still being black and a woman. 4. Take care of yourself. Acceptance, growth, and health are critical to a good life. Gabrielle Union grew up in the 1980s in the aptly named Pleasanton, California, not dissimilar to the eponymous town in the hit film Pleasantville. Pleasanton is a predominantly white suburb 30 minutes out of Oakland. Her parents were determined to climb the social ladder, so they worked hard to ensure the best possible schools and neighborhood for Union and her two sisters. However, this affluent community was less than idyllic for her. She describes living in Pleasanton as being invisible. Being one of the sole black people in both her school and neighborhood made her stand out in an unwanted way. But paradoxically, it also made her feel completely invisible when it came to being anyone's romantic interest. Throughout her childhood, she painstakingly attempted to fit in no matter what the cost. As an elementary schooler, she even allowed herself to get chemical burn lesions on her scalp in a vain attempt to get her hair as straight as humanly possible. She listened to Garth Brooks, mindfully watched the way she spoke, and didn't dare wrap her hair before bed at sleepovers for fear of standing out. She also went to great lengths to avoid the few other black students at school, and likewise, they avoided her. They were all doing their best to downplay their otherness as best as possible. Both the subtle and overt racism that she experienced impacted Union for the rest of her life. Throughout her childhood, she went by the name Nikki, as her family called her by her middle name, Monique. Her schoolmates instantly weaponized this name, taunting her as Nigger Nikki. As a teen, she described the various N-word slurs her peers would use so casually around her. Eventually, she assimilated so well they didn't even really consider her black, which only made them more comfortable using hateful language in her presence. But she didn't dare say a word about it, since she saw total assimilation as key to her survival. 
Looking back as an adult, she recognizes that in fact what truly helped her survive most was expanding her world, not trying to hide within it. In her tiny town, she felt out of place. She struggled just to have the typical childhood experiences most kids take for granted. However, at age 13, her mother began sending her to Omaha, Nebraska during the summer to stay with her grandmother. This expanded her world more than she ever knew it could. In Omaha, among her cousins and a neighborhood of people who looked like her, she found acceptance. She discovered a culture she was allowed to fully participate in, and she found her capacity to both love and be loved exactly as she was. There she bonded with friends over music by New Edition and hip-hop she couldn't hear back at home. She still had to mindfully code switch to assimilate to the many cultural differences there, which she wasn't used to, but in Omaha she found she could genuinely fit in. She mindfully avoided being labeled corny, the kiss of death to a teen girl in that town. But she felt like she could breathe easier, and even got her first kiss from a boy during one such summer. Though the later years in Omaha proved to be tumultuous, as the influx of drug dealers and gang influence infiltrated her tight-knit group, Union credits her time there with giving her more confidence and insight into her potential and her worth. By expanding her worldview beyond what she could see, Gabrielle Union eventually found a life she loved. This shaped her worldview, her career, and the way she saw herself for decades to come. Here is Union herself being interviewed by PBS Books at the LA Times Festival of Books. You know, my family calls me Nikki. You know, we're right. both from the Midwest, so yes. uh, Gabrielle Monique Union, mm -hmm. none of my family can say that. I've been <laughs> Nikki since birth, right. and not everybody knows Nikki. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think my Hollywood persona or whatever, and who, who the heck I really am, finally merged. Her world continued to expand through high school as she spent increasingly more time in other places where she was able to truly thrive. One such place was on the campus of San Jose State University. Her older sister Kelly was a student there, and she brought Gabrielle along to frat parties. There she was introduced to what she calls black excellence. She immersed herself in conversations with people who look like her and were academics and high achievers with a cool confidence that she wanted to emulate for herself. The dance floor was another place where she found the confidence that would later propel her onto the covers of magazines and movie screens. By day, Union and her friend Suki would cut school to hang out with the cool black boys in Oakland, and by night, the two would frequent an underage hip-hop club in Walnut Creek. There, she describes a Disneyland-like experience, with a room full of boys who could actually see her for her. These were the places Union found her voice and strength. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll continue our deep dive into Gabrielle Union's We're Going to Need More Wine. We'll discover that love is a steep learning curve. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our exploration into actress, activist, and author Gabrielle Union's bestseller, We're Going to Need More Wine. Last time we heard about Union's early years, we saw how she came to understand that the world is bigger than we know. In this part, we'll learn love is a steep learning curve and no matter how much we try, some things never change. Many of Gabrielle Union's stories center around love, both romantic and familial, from her first kiss in Omaha to her current marriage to Miami Heat shooting guard Dwayne Wade to the love she has for her mother. She vividly describes the many lessons she learned about love. Despite the racial tensions she faced in Pleasanton, Union did manage to have a couple of romantic relationships there. One was with Billy, a sandy-haired boy who had moved there from Fremont, a more diverse town a few miles from Pleasanton. The salacious word on the street was that he had had a black girlfriend, which was quite the scandal at the time. She and Billy didn't last long, but later in high school, she grew deeply attached to a boy named Alex, whom she dated for a couple of years. Despite his parents, one Greek and one Mexican, 
calling Alex a nigger lover for being with her, the two were inseparable. They broke up after Union grew resentful of having to financially support him, but at the time she was still so attached to him that she decked herself out in a cat burglar suit and snuck into his bushes to get a glance at her newly ex-boyfriend. Her parents also played a major factor in teaching her about love. As a teen, the cracks began to show in their marriage. One day, her older sister Kelly had surprised their father at work. There she found his desk adorned with photos of him with a woman that was not their mother. Kelly also found the revealing green ATM card. This was for the secret account their father used to fund his second life with a woman named Tony. Both sisters wielded this secret card over their father's head, asking to use it for whatever they wanted, daring him to refuse. Seeing their mother being rejected by their father over and over, and being lied to constantly made a lasting impression on Union's view of love and marriage. Their mother Teresa slept on the couch for the last five years of the marriage. This finally ended when their father refused to pay for their youngest daughter Tracy's braces, and their mortgage went unpaid. Teresa then got the strength to leave. Union admires her mother's resilience and dedication to her family, even at the cost of her own happiness. She allowed her heart to break so as not to disrupt the life and comforts that she and her daughters had come to know and love. Her parents' relationship in many ways parallels Union's own first marriage to NFL football player Chris Howard. She recalls the sheer doom and dread she felt the day she married him. The two had both been cheating on each other, and even after proposing, he still continued making plans with other women. Similar to her mother, Union clung to her husband, their five-year marriage, and the normalcy that she valued, despite the obvious signs that things were not working out. Here is Union being interviewed with live signing on YouTube. I had a problem, but it all comes from self-esteem. <laughs> And, you know, feeling like the more options I had that I took advantage of, um, the more successful I was or the better I was or the more attractive I was. Um, and also this idea that a lot of couples have that whoever brings home the most money um, is entitled to do whatever the hell they want. Mm -hmm. um, entitled to be disrespectful, entitled to, to not be loyal, entitled to... Lies. To lie. Right. To lie. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. A marriage counselor quit on them just 15 minutes after meeting them, saying, you don't belong together. Eventually, like her mother, she lowered her standards to essentially, I don't care who you do, just come home and be nice to me. But even that proved to be too high. After the pair were extorted by an adult entertainer called Cameron Camera, who threatened to leak photos of her having sex with Union's husband, she finally devised an exit strategy. They aimed for an amicable uncoupling. But ultimately, Howard left her with unpaid loans, bills, and even an abandoned Porsche that racked up fines in her name at Burbank Airport. After her first marriage, which she memorably describes as milk that spilled and curdled while she was still trying to pour it over cereal, Union spent several years single. During that time, she experienced unconditional love from her dog Bubba Sparks, a white mastiff puppy she got alongside DMX on the set of the film Cradle to the Grave. Not long after, she was introduced to her now husband, Dwayne Wade. They've been married since 2014, and after numerous miscarriages and failed IVF treatments, birthed daughter Kavya via surrogate in September of 2018. Over the course of the book, Gabrielle Union goes from being what she describes as a black daddy long leg spider with buck teeth whose parents worked arduously to provide for to a model, actress, activist living in a $30 million mansion. She recalls shoulder tapping adults for beer on a liquor store stoop, contrasted with exhilarating nights at Prince's most exclusive house parties. While fame and success do change some things, like her ability to buy yeast infection medication in public, Union also talks about the things that no amount of money can change. She calls this the mountain of assimilation, on the other side of which there is supposed to be acceptance and wholeness, but in reality what she's found is simply another mountain. Since childhood, Gabrielle Union grew up with the mantra, you're going to have to be bigger, badder, better, just to be considered equal. Her family instilled in her the notion that being black means you will not be taken seriously unless you accomplish twice as much as everyone else and expect no credit or recognition in return. 
Despite doing just that and attaining success, fame, and fortune, she still sees this lesson ring true throughout the course of her life. In 2011, after making millions of dollars, winning awards, starring in movies and on TV shows, Union attended her 20-year high school reunion back in Pleasanton, California. In the parking lot of the event, a backhanded compliment instantly reminded her of that same second-class status. A former classmate remarked, For a black girl, you sure are pretty. Statements like these are constant reminders that at the end of the day, she is still seen first and foremost as black, which equates to lesser in many people's minds, regardless of how far up that mountain she's climbed. Here is Union herself being interviewed by PBS Books at the LA Times Festival of Books. Smiling is a defense mechanism that I I developed very early on. trying to put people at ease and make people comfortable with me and making myself as small and as um, palatable as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, But all of that comes out of a sense of not feeling worthy just from birth. And so you get good at that. And then I start to lie for a living Mm. and I start to put on masks for a living and then that's the expectation. Um, So smiling through pain is standard. I don't even, it's not even something I think about. She also has a chapter simply titled Mittens, where she further illustrates the prejudice she still fights to this day simply because of the color of her skin. She describes bundling up to walk around her mansion-lined Chicago neighborhood in winter. While walking, she encounters two other bundled-up women who visibly panic and murmur thug because of the small amount of her brown skin visible. Still striving to assimilate, she equips herself with striped mittens whenever she goes walking, reasoning... Thugs don't wear mittens. She still feels she has to constantly prove to her own neighbors that she is not a threat. Her success doesn't change anything for those close to her either. Before marrying Union, Wade was raising two sons from a previous marriage as well as his nephew. The three teenage boys simply wanting to walk their dog in their Miami neighborhood became an all-points alert for their security guards. Neighbors called the police seemingly due to the boys' mere presence in the area. The realities of having three tall black boys in a stand-your-ground state where anyone feeling threatened has the right to fire a gun is a daily anxiety for the entire family. Both Union and her husband drop what they call black bombs on the boys. This is what they call their periodic reminders of their stark reality that their house, their last name, and their money cannot save them from being assumed as a threat, a criminal, or worse. Being a woman is a whole other mountain union faces, and there it seems her success actually works against her in some ways. Both the spotlight and the workload means that she's unable to be a conventional stay-at-home mom or even a typical working mother. Instead, she must parent her stepsons and now her new daughter between work travels, precisely as her husband does. However, simply due to being a woman, she is the one questioned, scrutinized, and criticized over her ability to parent. Her body is also incessantly and publicly scrutinized and speculated about. She describes being raked through the mud over a nose job, which she swears she has never gotten. She paints Hollywood as a place where women are not allowed to age, pitted against each other constantly, and eventually replaced by a younger model. In one story, she goes to the hospital for an MRI for her hip. But she's first asked repeatedly by four different nurses whether or not she is pregnant due to a recent tabloid alleging her secret pregnancy. Such events remind her that no amount of success can spare her from the many unfair expectations placed on her as a woman. This includes being expected to publicly detail the most private information about her body and reproductive health in a way that her male counterparts, including her own husband, are not. Let's take one last break. When we return, we'll conclude our book insight on Gabrielle Union's We're Going to Need More Wine. We'll have a brief recap, look at the legacy of the book, and learn Union's last lesson. Take care of yourself. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights.
We're wrapping up our deep dive into actress and activist Gabrielle Union's We're Going to Need More Wine. Last time we learned that love has a steep learning curve and also that some things never change. In this part, we'll learn the importance of taking care of yourself. We'll review everything we learned, then consider the wider implications of Union's book. Self-care, acceptance, and growth are themes Union touches on in many of her stories. The most gripping is her harrowing description of the night she was sexually assaulted in the back of a Payless shoe source at 19 years old. After her freshman year at the University of Nebraska, Union returned to her hometown and worked at the local shoe store. There had been a string of robberies there that summer by a former Payless employee. He was familiar with the store's complete lack of security, as well as the amount of cash it routinely had on hand. That night, Union and a co-worker were just minutes away from closing the store and clocking out when the armed robber came in demanding all the cash in the register. The daily bank deposit had already been made, so there was only $200 remaining. This infuriated the thief, so he turned his sights on Union. He held her at gunpoint and raped her in the back of the store. She cried, fought, and pleaded for her life, even managing to grab the gun at one point and shoot her attacker. But he ultimately escaped and wasn't caught until days later. He was sentenced to 33 years in prison, and Union won a lawsuit against Payless for gross negligence. This incident scarred her for life. She had severe panic attacks, refused to leave her house or go to many public places for years following. It took countless sessions of therapy and intense self-care for her to get back to functioning. She felt permanently damaged, worthless, and victimized. But she pushed herself and sought out group therapy for rape survivors, saying it was the only place she felt not crazy. To this day, she still never sits in public restaurants with her back facing the door and avoids going into banks for fear of ever being held at gunpoint again. But her dedication to caring for herself during that most trying time allowed her to go from hiding in fear to shining in the spotlight. Here is Union being interviewed with live signing on YouTube. But that connection lets you know you're not alone. Yeah. And it's so important to know that you're not alone mm -hmm. because that's when you feel like you're isolated, like you're screaming into a hurricane that like no one could possibly understand what you're feeling is when it can spiral into a very dark place. Mm -hmm. As an adult, her passion for self-care led to her advocacy work for many causes that are dear to her heart, including rape survivor resources and Planned Parenthood. She later became an ambassador for the Susan G. Komen Foundation, inspired by her high school dance floor buddy, Suki. Union and Suki remained friends for years following their time at Foothill High. In 2006, the two had a chance encounter in Las Vegas, and Union learned that her dear friend had stage 4 metastatic breast cancer. It was terminal. Suki died four painful years later and encouraged Union to help keep others from going down the same path she did. Suki felt that her fear to get checked by a doctor cost her her life, so Gabrielle Union has used her name and platform to urge women to push past fear and to truly care for their bodies. Yet even with how far she has come, all the good she has brought to valuable organizations, and how much she has grown, Union finishes the book in full recognition of the personal growth she must continue to press on towards. She illustrates this with a story about Ray. Suki's brother Ray was also a dear friend, who Union keeps in touch with to this day. She considered the two of them her best friends during high school and college. While home from college one Christmas, Ray revealed to Union that he was gay. She was devastated that he had revealed this to everyone except her, and that she had incorrectly assumed his sexual preference. But most of all, she felt humiliated because he pointed out how she had been a part of the problem. In the same way that her peers used hateful language about her race, he showed her that she too had mindlessly used homophobic language around Ray, saying words like fag and gay to mean something lame. She had also been part of the many students pressuring him to sleep with a particular girl who was interested in him, and insisted on his behalf to everyone who would listen that he was straight. She uses this story to show how she remains a work in progress, and how far she, and we all, 
have to go with acceptance, inclusion, and awareness of our differences. But most of all, she reminds us of our human commonalities and the struggles that we all face. She hopes that we can empathize with one another and be mindful of those around us who may be suffering in silence. All in all, We're Going to Need More Wine is a feel-everything book. It's a wide-open view into the life of Gabrielle Union as a child, a teen star, and now as an adult celebrity. It's her hysterical recollections of stories like her first husband proposing while eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, juxtaposed with heart-wrenching moments, like when her therapist challenged her to list things that make her happy, and she couldn't think of even one. We looked at four overarching motifs that run through the book. First was the value in expanding your world beyond what you can see, to find your true self. Next, we looked at love's steep learning curve through Union's parents' marriage, her own marriages, and familial love that binds them all. Third was the concept that even fame and fortune has limited effects on the discrimination and disparity faced by black women. Finally, we went through the lessons on self-care, health, and personal growth that Union stressed throughout the book. Since its release in 2017, We're Going to Need More Wine has garnered much attention, particularly since it hit the shelves at the start of the hashtag MeToo movement. To date, the book has sold over 1 million copies and was one of the top-selling autobiographies the year it was released. It's been widely praised for being an authentic, raw, and brutally honest look at the good, bad, and extremely personal life of this complicated and inspiring celebrity. She was lauded by Oprah and many others for shedding light on difficult topics that others shy away from. We're Going to Need More Wine won a Book of the Year award from The Root and was nominated for an NAACP award for literature. The few criticisms cite the profanity-filled writing as amateurish and immature, and some point out the glaring omission of Dwayne Wade's impregnating another woman during their dating relationship. However, the reactions were largely positive, with most critics crediting Union for her bravery and honesty. Since writing the book, Gabrielle Union has continued to share more of her story at book signings, conferences, and award ceremonies. She continues to be an outspoken advocate against the cutthroat culture of women in Hollywood, the lack of diversity and inclusion in entertainment, and injustices facing women and minorities. The book feels like a chat with a close friend over a glass of wine, while at the same time a therapy session Gabrielle Union is having with herself. Her pain and healing is palpable, and it's clear that many wounds are still healing. But it's also filled with hope and redemption. The entire work can be summed up in the phrase Union says she would tell her younger self. You were fly, dope, and amazing from birth. From the time you took your first breath, you were worthwhile and valid. I'm sorry you had to wait so long to learn that for yourself. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.